Dr. Shabir, welcome to Let the Quran Speak. My pleasure to be on. Pilgrims are in Saudi Arabia, Dr. Shabir, performing the Hajj, um, intended to deepen their connection with God and forgive their sins and draw closer together, Dr. Shabir, uh, with the Muslim community. There are so many lessons of, of, of Hajj, and I thought it would be useful for us to talk a little bit about some of those lessons, elaborate on them, um, so we can understand what is the significance of all of the things that we do in Hajj. You know, there are little rituals that you mentioned before. Um, what do they mean, and why are we doing them? Yeah, so yeah, I think that's a very important question because a lot of people go, they go through the rituals, they go through the motions, and they come back and they, their lives are not changed. So uh, it should be a life-changing experience. And to make it a life-changing experience, you need to focus on the spirituality. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the Quran talking about the preparation to go for Had says, But azawadu fa inna khayra zad taqwa. Uh, that's in the second chapter of the Quran saying, uh, uh, make your preparations, but the best preparation is taqwa, which mm -hmm. is an Arabic word meaning something like awareness of God. Uh, so one has to go there with the awareness of God. Uh, the uh, Quran speaking about these uh, days uh, says, Waskurullaha fi ayyamin ma'dudat. Remember God uh, uh, on, on, on the numbered days uh, or on the known days. So it's about remembrance of God. Uh, the, the sacrifice that we do, the Quran says that God has given you animals uh, by which you can express your thanks to God. So it's thanksgiving. So at every step of the way, there is the remembrance of God, there is thanksgiving to God, uh, there is the awareness of God and all of that. So we have to keep that in mind uh, from the very get-go. Otherwise, we just go through the motions and in the end, uh, it doesn't have an impact on our lives. Mm -hmm. There's also this really interesting connection to our history. You know, it's not just Muslims here and now, but also making us remember our legacy and, and all of the greats that came before us and all of the sacrifices that they made for, for God. Yes, and of course, uh, for, for many people, this has a very deep meaning. Uh, and uh, in a sermon, uh, I, I said to Muslims that, uh, you know, you're going there, uh, you're going to wear sandals uh, for some days. That's when you're in that state of sacredness and uh, um, you have to wear sandals instead of regular shoes, for, for men at least. And that may mean that your toes will mingle with the same sand on which the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, walked. At that point, I heard a, a, a heavy sigh from uh, one of the uh, brothers sitting there in the congregation. Like it really touched him mm -hmm. to, to think that, yeah, this is the reality. So you're right. It, it connects us with our history. We go, and not just the Prophet Muhammad, but Abraham, right? That's right. And exactly. Hagar and Ishmael. Yeah. Yes, uh, because uh, they, they were going back and forth between the two mountains, Safwa and Marwa, that connects us with Hagar because it is said in our tradition that that's what she did to look for water for her child. Uh, when we stone the pillars, uh, as Abraham did, we're feeling connected with Abraham. When we perform the sacrifice, we are feeling that connection with Abraham who performed the sacrifice. But even the Kaaba itself, the Quran tells us in the second chapter, where the Yarfa Ibrahim al Kawaida min al Bayti wa Ismail, uh, when Abraham and his son Ishmael uh, raised the foundation of the Kaaba. So that Kaaba, which is the object of uh, the, the um, pilgrim's quest to get there, uh, that is said to be uh, established uh, by Abraham and his son Ishmael. Uh, who in Islamic tradition are both uh, prophets and, and we revere them as prophets and messengers of God. So we feel this connection with the larger history of the world, uh, with the Bible, with uh, sacred history, the sacred history of uh, Jews and our Christian friends, our Jewish and Christian friends. And uh, it just gives us that sense that uh, uh, Muslims altogether are connected with each other from around the world. And uh, we are connected with this larger history uh, of the world and with the great religions of the world. Mm -hmm. Dr. Shabir, can you talk a little bit about that state of purity that, that one brings oneself into to perform the Hajj? Yes. So that state of sacredness means that uh, we are now, uh, in a way, semi cut off from the rest of civilization. And we're just devoted to God in these days. Like, you have to keep your thoughts on. You see, when you have something specific to do in terms of rituals, uh, then you have a way of focusing your, your mind. If you just say, okay, now you're in the state of, uh, you know, just be consecrated to God during these days. But what does that mean? In the Bible, when someone was consecrated to God, it was said, this person is not allowed to drink any wine. 
so, um, like Samson, for example, in the state of consecration, um, not not to drink any wine, uh, and and sometimes they're consecrated from their mother's womb. Mm. So this idea of consecration of being dedicated to God. Now, of course, we can't say the Muslim don't drink any wine in these days because that's more <laughs> general, right? That's all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, but for these days of consecration, what's it said to the Muslim? You can't pluck any hairs. You can't uh, trim your nails. So, so now the Muslim is uh, very conscious, especially when it comes to plucking the hairs, because if you're going to comb your beard or your hair, you want to make sure that you don't, you know, if any, any falls off inadvertently, especially for me, I'm an old man, what can you expect, <laughs> right? Uh, but if it falls off inadvertently, then that's no harm, but you, you're not going to deliberately pull one because, okay, this one is bothering me, just pull it out, right? Uh, if something is really uh, bothering you, and there are some some stipulations on what you can do about it, like let's say a broken nail, for example. But on the whole, you're not going to um, do anything to your body. So so you have to keep your mind on that that you're in the state of sacredness. So for example, you can't apply any perfume, and uh, somebody brings some perfume for you, you know, out of uh, love. They say, oh yeah, I just bought this perfume. Try it out. No, you have to remember that you're in that mm -hmm. state of sacredness. You're not going to have it. So because you have to remember this all of the time, then that means that your mind is continuously uh, dedicated to God. You are thoroughly conscious that I am here for the sake of God, and I'm going to maintain this for His sake. So this total remembrance of God. That's what the uh, sacredness is really all about. Mm -hmm. And then it's like a sea of people and they're all dressed exactly the same, men and women, performing the very same rituals. That's also very significant, I think, Dr. Shabir. Yes, it's very significant. And you know, when, when Muslims gather on the, um, on the plains of Arafat, this is where um, this is the, the highlight uh, of, of the Hajj. This is, you know, this, if, you, if you're not there, then you haven't done the Hajj and you can't prepare uh, this slaps by mm -hmm. doing something else as a compensation, you'd have to come back the following year and do it all over again. Uh, so when you are there and you're there with Muslims from all around the globe and all of the men are wearing uh, simple uh, sheets of, of cloth draped, draped around their shoulders and uh, wrapped around their waists, um, then you know, there is a leveling of all humankind here because king or pauper everyone is going to have the same uh, sort of appearance. Mm -hmm. um, so, so there is this unity of all humankind that is demonstrated here like nowhere else. Mm -hmm. uh, but there is also um, uh, other, uh, there, there are also other uh, significances of this that Muslims have now uh, read into this, like they interpret it this way. It's not mentioned in the Quran or mentioned in a, in a hadith by the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, as far as I can tell. But Muslims typically think of that gathering on the day of uh, Arafah as somehow symbolizing our eventual gathering on, on, uh, uh, in the court of God on the day of judgment. Mm -hmm. When all people will be gathered there, everyone will be there, and uh, all of our sins will be laid bare for all to see unless God is merciful to us and hides our, our sins. Mm -hmm. So in, in a way, uh, being in this state of sacredness you asked me about, uh, that uh, somehow typifies for, for Muslims uh, the uh, eventual uh, demise of uh, all human beings from this earth. Because uh, the way in which a Muslim is going to be prepared for burial is that the Muslim's body is going to be washed and uh, the body is going to be draped in two, three, five pieces of cloth. Um, similarly, unstitched pieces of cloth. They're not made to conform to the shape of the human body. Mm -hmm. uh, so in a similar way, a, a Muslim pilgrim will take a bath and then don these uh, unstitched pieces of clothing. So it's as if going into the Hajj, into that sacred state, is a sort of preparation mentally for eventually uh, leaving this world. And that's a good time for reflecting. We can see the connection mm -hmm. and it's a, and the similarity. So it's a good time to reflect on the fact that as we're saying goodbye to our families and friends and uh, we're, we're leaving for another domain to go and perform the Hajj, uh, let us reflect on the idea that uh, eventually we have to leave this domain. So it's time to say goodbye to family and friends and for, ask forgiveness of people because we have, may have done them wrong. We don't want them to have a claim on us in the life in the life hereafter. We ask for their forgiveness now, just as the pilgrim asks for forgiveness before going to perform the pilgrimage because we're going there to ask God for his forgiveness and we want people to forgive us first. Mm -hmm. So, so too with life in general. Mm -hmm. 
Dr. Shabir, there's a difference because, you know, when we're when we're standing on the plains of Arafa, we have a second chance, right? We have a second opportunity to change our lives around, right? We can be forgiven and change our lives, whereas on the Day of Judgment, you know, that opportunity won't come again, right? That's right. So yeah. it's, it's a wonderful, uplifting moment at the same time. Yes, yes, you're absolutely right. Thank you for your thoughts, Dr. Shabir. You're welcome. Tired of seeing how Muslims are depicted in media? You can help. Support Muslim Media Hub, the first of its kind to empower young Muslims to create content for film, TV, and social media. Visit our website, QuranSpeaks.com, and donate.